Hello. The reason I'm here today is to talk about mirrorless cameras. Is it time to switch to a mirrorless camera? First, I want to discuss what is mirrorless and how do we get to the point we are. Number two, the important parts of the camera. And finally, what camera companies should I consider? What cameras should I consider and why? Let me give you first a little bit of history about cameras. Originally, we had very simple cameras with no viewfinder at all. Impossible to focus. Then we went to the very simple rangefinder cameras. The viewfinder is actually here and you look through and you are not looking through the taking lens. And that's the important part, the taking lens. You're looking through another viewfinder. The next derivative came up in twin lens reflex. And what this did is this went from uh, a viewfinder that was not very similar to the actual taking lens to a taking lens and a viewing lens. They were stacked so that the uh, perspective would be very similar. And this worked for a long time until they came up with the current version, which is the single lens reflex. You are actually looking through the taking lens through a mirror. The mirror is placed there so you can look. It's corrected, it's inverted, and it's so it's correct when you look through and see it. But the problem with this is, number one, you have a, a mirror that takes up space and that has to be physically moved out of the way and then placed back to be able to see again. This was a very good solution for a very long time. This was advanced by both Nikon and Canon in the early mid-50s early, mid and, and then the 60s. Then we had the introduction of the mirrorless cameras, which actually started out in the compact camera industry. But the technology grew so quickly and advanced so quickly that it became practical in much larger cameras. And the advantage to the mirrorless camera is multiple. Number one, it's smaller. It's smaller because the mirror is no longer needed. And consequently, the lens flange, the distance between the sensor and the back of the lens has been reduced to almost nothing. So you can get the lens very close to the sensor. Now this helps in making the camera smaller. The other thing is, because there is no mirror to move up and down, mirrorless lens are quieter. Many of them have an absolutely silent mode. So you can actually turn all of the noise off. You can work in dead silence. This is handy in an environment where you would like to be quiet. A church, a wedding, something where you need to keep quiet. And finally, Technology is moving ahead and making mirrorless a less expensive way to build a camera. The mechanical aspect of the single lens reflex is pretty much been pared down to as cheap as it can get. But as the technology grows, the mirrorless camera is a technology driven cost cutting uh, advantage. Eventually, it may be cheaper, probably will be cheaper as a matter of fact. The important parts of the camera are the sensor, the processor, and obviously the lens. Now in the old days we used to say you could put the lens on a box. The camera didn't make any difference. And that was pretty much true. You could put a Leica lens on a very cheap camera and as long as it functioned it would actually give you a very good result. That's not true anymore. The thing that you hear the most about is of course the sensor. And the sensor is very important. The size of it, the quality of it, the size of the megapixels, the amount of megapixels. But another thing that doesn't get mentioned nearly as often is also pretty important is the processor. An example of the processor is there have been times when, although Nikon is very reluctant to admit this, they use the same sensor as Sony their processor has actually been better than Sony's. And the reason for this is probably because although Sony's been in the game with the Mavica, uh, the first, one of the first digital cameras, the Mavica, in the early 80s, 1981, 1982, 
Nikon has been a player in the camera industries since the early 60s in a big way. And they understand the processing of an image very well, as does Canon. Very, very, very good job with their processors. Sony's catching up. I think they're still just a tad behind, but they're catching up very quickly. So the sensor is important. Now the lenses are, are very important at this point. It is my opinion that they are going to become less important as we get into software correction. Now what do I mean by software correction? When I bought this camera, brand new 2012, there was no converter for it in Adobe Lightroom. And I took some pictures with this camera, with this lens, the 16 to 50. And I processed them through Lightroom, and they were horrible. They were very badly distorted. But strangely enough, when the plug-in came to Lightroom for the Sony cameras, all of a sudden, all of those defects went away. And the image was actually not bad at all. Pretty good. That said, on this camera, that kit lens, that very inexpensive kit lens, versus this Zeiss lens, which is much larger, much heavier, I am, this is, this is an astounding image compared to that one. So the lens does make a difference. But the importance of the lens, I think, is diminishing as they develop software to correct. As long as the aberrations are predictable, software can remove the majority of the imperfections. So I guess what I'm getting at is the sensor and the processor are becoming more important and the lens less important. Why am I talking about that? What difference does it make? What cameras should you consider is based on a large part about the sensor and the processor. So what can I tell you about the sensor and the processor? There are three big players in the professional industry at this point in time. There's Canon with a large market share of 43% or so. That's in 2014. Nikon, 32%. And Sony with a quickly rising 13% in the professional market or quasi-professional market. The A7 is really bringing up Sony's market share. The A6000 is also helping. As you may or may not be aware, Sony produces sensors for a lot of folks. Sony has well over 40% of the sensor market. And since the sensor market is not defined by what size of sensor they're developing, what it doesn't say is for the professional camera industry that Sony has a very large stake. They are putting 100 megapixel sensors in medium format cameras. They're providing full frame sensors to numerous makers, including Nikon. And they are developing camera sensors for telephones, for Apple, uh, and probably a lot of other manufacturers. So Sony is a big stakeholder in the sensor market. They recently bought Toshiba, which is one of the big players up to that point. So who else are the big players in the sensor market? Well, Samsung is a big player. Samsung does not appear to be interested in the camera market. It appears they may be trying to, at this point in time, divest themselves of their professional camera sensor line, or at least make it available for other companies. It was rumored at one point that Nikon was buying that division of Samsung. However, that appears not to have been true. That said, Nikon could very well be interested in Samsung's technology so that they aren't quite so dependent upon Sony. Canon appears to be making their own sensors or getting out their processors to somebody else who is working for them very well. Canon is not listed among the top 10 sensor producers. And since Canon does not seem to be producing a lot of sensors for other people, Canon probably has a small disadvantage when it comes to their own sensors, although they're doing a very good job of staying in the market and staying competitive. Their processors are also excellent. 
So if you're with a Canon, I'm not going to tell you you're with the wrong company. I'm not going to tell you that Nikon is not a good choice. However, I am going to tell you that in the mirrorless technology, there are other players that are very worthy of your consideration. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the companies. Now, the biggest company is Samsung by far and away, much bigger than Sony, two and a half times. Sony, followed shortly by Panasonic, are very large companies. Both Sony and Panasonic are about three times as large as Canon and about ten times as large as Nikon, with Fuji kind of in the middle, Fujifilm. The size of the companies really doesn't make all that much difference except for that it means they are able to develop technology. Sony has invested very heavily in the sensor market over the past few years. They have seen this as an opportunity to expand their business after some years of contraction and they have lost a lot of market share. They're trying to regrow and they're trying to regrow it in this industry. Now Sony does seem to be very interested in the pro market because the pro market seems to be remaining stable while the compact camera market seems to be shrinking at a very quick rate. It seems to be being replaced by camera phones. Panasonic is a big player in the movie market, in the video market. They make a good camera too, but they are really prized by the video sector. The video sector have taken the, the Panasonic GH series and really made them a commodity to be sought after. I don't know where Panasonic is getting their sensors, but they certainly have the capability to be able to develop their own if they wished, or to influence the sensor manufacturers to provide them with sensors for their cameras. The videographers realize that the four-third sensor very closely approximates the uh, 35 millimeter sensor that they use in, in video. So it's a very good format for video. They also make it very good still camera. But their real forte has been the video market and their penetration has been excellent. Sony has been intruding into their market just a little bit because of the APS-C and the full frame sensor, especially with the A7S. The A7S does an excellent job and it competes very well with some very, very expensive video only camera equipment. Sony has been working very hard to increase their market share. Now I don't have any figures on Panasonic's penetration because it's not specifically a, a professional camera Fuji also has done a good job. Fujifilm has made some excellent products with primarily the APS-C format. So it's not shooting for the full frame. The cameras that I think are the best to consider if you're switching from the Canon are going to be the Sony with a converter. The Sony has a, a, a Canon specific converter which retains all of the functions of the Canon lens. There is also one in development that's close to production for the Nikon. I have one on order. I'll have to see how that works. When it comes to the other manufacturers, both Fuji and Panasonic, um, even when you get to Olympus, they can be all adapted to those cameras, but they do not have autofocus capabilities yet. You can still meter with them, but it is not autofocus. There are a lot of advantages to the mirrorless technology. The lens is closer to the sensor. All else being equal, they're lighter. What I have here are fairly comparable lenses as far as their, their zoom ability. And you can see the Lumix series, the Sony APS-C, the Sony full frame, the Nikon APS-C and a Canon full frame, and this is a large Canon full frame, and this is only a 50 millimeter on it, but you can see the progression in size, although the APS-C Sony A6000 is much smaller than even the Micro Four Thirds. This happens to be a very compact camera, been very successful. So they are lighter and smaller, all else being equal. They are quieter. They have no mirror to flop. They are not going to introduce a vibration into your camera. You're going to need your remote much less often with a mirrorless than you are with a DSLR, with the 
with the mirror flopping, it's not going to be an issue with the mirrorless. But one of the most important considerations about the mirrorless technology is that it's moving forward very quickly and it's making tremendous improvements. The fact that the mirrorless used to be much slower focusing is not true anymore. The focusing speed of the mirrorless is very quickly approaching and may soon exceed that of the DSLR. So the technologies are moving the mirrorless forward. The DSLR has been pretty much moved to its ultimate at this point, and all we're seeing is incremental improvements on the DSLR, whereas the mirrorless technology is still advancing because it is technology driven at a very quick rate. If you're looking for a smaller, lighter camera or a quieter camera, a travel camera, or if you're taking photography for weddings, that type of thing, the mirrorless technology does have some significant advantages for you. If you want a camera that's big to impress your clients, the mirrorless probably isn't the way to do it. If that's what you need, keep a big heavy camera that looks impressive. But the quality that you're going to get from the Sony a7R Mark II is going to be very, very close to the very best DSLRs you can get, if not better. So there is no, there is no loss. At the present time, you can use Canon lenses on the Sony's, retain full functionality. Nikon's hopefully not long before you will be able to do that. Is there anything wrong with your DSLR? Is there any reason to trash it? No. They still work. They still work very fine. The images are excellent. Are there advantages to the mirrorless technology? I absolutely think there are. And I think they're going to be more and more as time goes by. So if you're looking to invest in new camera gear, then the mirrorless technology is good to look at. If all you need to do is continue doing what you're doing and you're happy with the DSLRs, stay with the DSLRs. I think there's going to be more and more advantages to the mirrorless technology as time progresses. But for the time being, there's no need to switch. One final thing I want to talk about too, because it would be unfair to Canon and Nikon not to mention this, is that the product support, the professional product support, the support by Canon and Nikon is very good. Canon is superlative. Nikon is good. There is professional support showing up now from Sony, Fuji, and Panasonic for their cameras, Olympus II for that matter. It's not to the degree or extent of Canon or, or even Nikon, but it's close. Sony's been doing a great job of trying to move theirs into the professional market, as has uh, Panasonic. Fuji has always been a pretty good supporter of their professional line, and they're, they're moving stronger and stronger into that. But uh, I, it would be remiss of me not to say that, that Canon really does support the professional in a very great way. So Sony still has a little bit of way to go to support your products quite as well as Canon. Now, that could change in a heartbeat because at the product announcements at uh, CES, Sony made a big deal about the A7 and their commitment to the A7 series. But I did want to bring a balanced perspective to the factors you should consider when making a switch. If you're happy with the DSLRs and you don't need a camera, there is no reason to change that's compelling. And there are some reasons to stay with your, your Nikon or Canon systems. If you're looking to make a change anyway, the mirrorless cameras are making huge advances and may soon have an advantage over all the DSLRs. So I would feel comfortable going to the Sony, the Fujifilm, the Panasonic Lumix, or the Olympus models. They're all very good. So depending upon what you need, if you're replacing your cameras, take a look. I think you'll be happy.